Welcome everyone um, to another Facebook Live event, um, another one of our Facebook Live events actually, um, today which will be on Marxism and ecology in a time of pandemic. Um, my name is Nadia, I'm going to be your chair uh, for this event this evening um, and we've got some fantastic speakers who I'll be introducing very shortly. Um, but before I do, I'd just like to say and uh, ask everyone to share the live stream as much as possible on Facebook, Twitter with the hashtag uh, healthcare bef uh, health before profits um, so we can get as many people as possible joining us uh, for this discussion today. Um, so, like I said, uh, we've got some great speakers tonight um, who I'm really excited to introduce. Um, Starting us off uh, for the uh, meeting today will be John Bellamy Foster. John Bellamy Foster is a professor of sociology um, at the University of Oregon. Um, he's also the editor of the Monthly Review and has uh, authored a number of books, um, including Marx's Ecology, Materialism and Nature, which I have here, um, and a book coming out very soon called The Return of Nature, Socialism and Ecology. Um, and so everyone uh, have a look out for that when uh, that uh, comes out very shortly. Um, then we'll be hearing from Martin Empson, who's a long-standing climate activist um, and an author of Land and Labour. And our final speaker will be Amy Leather, who is a contributing author to uh, System Change, Not Climate Change. Um, Sorry, I have a copy of System Change Not Climate Change here. Um, you can get it from bookmarks as you can uh, do with John Bellamy Foster's book too. Um, but Amy uh, Leather is also the Joint National Secretary um, of the Socialist Worker Party. Um, and so those three speakers uh, will be uh, starting off our discussion today. Um, and just to explain how the meeting is going to run, um, we'll be hearing from our speakers, but it's really important that we hear from you uh, at home too. So uh, comment in the uh, comment box below with your questions, uh, contributions, um, the comment box uh, below the, this video um, and the way the meeting is going to run is that after our speak after we've initially heard from all of our speakers we're going to have two rounds of questions um, and our speakers will have an opportunity to respond to some of the things people uh, are saying um, now before i move on um, i'd just like to say again please 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 keep sharing the live stream with the hashtag uh, health before profits on twitter on facebook um, and social media and so on um, but without further ado um, i'd like to bring in our first speaker who will be john bellamy foster so john would you like to start us off hello uh, i'm glad to be here i'm going to uh, talk on uh, the subject of um, the metabolic rift and uh, COVID-19. And most of you probably um, are familiar with Marx's theory of metabolic rift. It, at this point, uh, it's uh, Marx's uh, primary uh, ecological conception, but it's also in many ways the the beginnings of, um, of uh, ecological systems theory. Uh, the basic structure of Marx's uh, metabolic rift theory is that um, he saw production and labor process in terms of uh, what he called the metabolism or the social metabolism between human beings and nature. Uh, production was then not defined simply economically but it was uh, defined as, as a transformation of, uh, of nature, uh, of the human relation to nature, and uh, more specifically as representing uh, the me metabolism or social metabolism between human beings and nature. Obviously, all species uh, have um, a metabolic relations to um, the entirety of nature, um, but Marx argued that through the labor process and production, human beings created a unique social metabolism that defined uh, their uh, relation to nature, uh, which was active and transformative. He used the concept of the universal metabolism of nature to refer to uh, all natural processes together. And uh, he referred to the 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 social metabolism or simply uh, metabolism, metabolic relations to refer to uh, human 
productive relations. And uh, this is critical because it ties all of Marx's uh, economic analysis, his critique of capitalism in general, to uh, an ecological critique. He built this, um, well, I, sh I should say that the third concept is, is the concept of metabolic rift, that he introduced the, the notion that uh, under capitalism particularly, but not simply under capitalism, there uh, was a tendency to create a rift between uh, human beings and nature and an irreparable rift. He called it at one time, referring to the fact that it was destructive uh, related to, to uh, death or to, um, to uh, absolute uh, destruction, where, where um, capitalist production actually broke the natural cycles, the relation to nature undermined uh, the conditions of, of human uh, existence, of the human and social metabolism. So the metabolic rift becomes his major theory of ecological crisis. He developed this, uh, he introduced the concept of social metabolism, but he, he developed this on the basis of work in um, on on uh, metabolism that had been uh, developed by uh, cell biologists and in, in Germany and elsewhere from the beginning of the 19th century. And um, uh, what Marx is, um, and, and they began to um, point towards uh, an ecological conception in, in um, their more systemic uses of, of the notion of, of metabolism. And Marx, who uh, became deeply embedded in this, was particularly influenced by the work of Justice von Liebig, the great German chemist, who um, uh, not only employed the, the concept of metabolism, but also uh, explained that um, the, um, there was a soil crisis that uh, where the, the, the um, Food, the food and fiber shipped to the cities uh, in, in industrialized uh, capitalist agriculture was actually shipping the soil nutrients as well, uh, where, the, where the soil nutrients contributed to pollution and uh, polluting the water and the air in the, of the cities and, uh, and uh, the nutrients didn't return to the soil. And Marx used this um, as, um, a basis for, for um, understanding uh, the metabolic rift between uh, human beings and nature. Now, um, what isn't understood um, uh, completely, although we've kind of developed um, Marx's metabolic rift analysis and extended it out and works like um, my uh, Marx's ecology, uh, the um, the um, ecological rift that I wrote with uh, Brett Clark and Richard York, the um, uh, work of Andreas Malm, Koei Saito's Karl Marx's Eco-Socialism, and uh, Martin Emson's work, and a lot of other uh, works have developed the, the implications of Marx's theory of metabolic rift and traced it out in other areas. But We've ten tended to, uh, to ignore the relation to epidemiology or that part hasn't been developed uh, yet. And, I, uh, and it's particularly important in terms of the, the um, COVID-19 crisis. In my uh, book coming out in, at the end of the month, The Return of Nature, uh, which I spent 20 years off and on working on, uh, some of the epidemiological analysis in Engels and in Marx and in, in Marx's um, uh, close friend, uh, E. Ray Lancaster, I'll, I'll mention that more, is, is traced out. But I wanted to, to explain that um, Marx's metabolic rift is related to the um, whole question of, um, of um, the etiology is of disease as well, which Engels uh, addressed quite phenomenally in, in the condition of the working class. And if you look at Marx's capital, if you look at um, page 348 and um, at the bottom, you'll find that um, Marx uh, says the um, 
apart from the daily more threatening advance of the working class movement, the limiting of factory labor was dictated by the same necessity as forced the manuring of English fields with guano. The guano trade was one of the ways in which uh, capitalism uh, tried to uh, overcome the metabolic rift, the soil crisis by, by um, importing guano from Peru to, to put on British fields. So he says, um, was dictated by the same necessity as forced the manuring of English fields with guano, the same blind desire for profit that in the one case exhausted the soil had in the other case seized hold of the vital force of the nation and its roots. Periodical epidemics speak at cl as clearly on this point as the diminishing military standard of height in France and Germany. Uh, the the um, reference to periodic uh, epidemics is uh, is meant to tie that to the, the metabolic rift, to um, the uh, rupturing of ecological relations associated with the destruction of the soil and the guano trade. And, uh, and then Marx goes right from there into a discussion of Engels and, and, and of course, what Engels said about um, disease in, in 1844 in the condition of the English working class. So um, there is this tradition of analysis. It's, there is quite a bit on, in Engels and Marx on, on the disease phenomenon. And then E. Ray Lancaster, who was a who was a, a close friend of, of Marx and, and uh, uh, Charles Darwin and, and Thomas Huxley's protege, and also uh, who worked um, with Louis Pasteur. Um, um, Lancaster was, E. Ray Lancaster was the greatest zoologist, um, the leading zoologist in England in the, in the generation after, after um, uh, Darwin. And uh, Lancaster uh, talked, um, he wrote um, extensively about um, disease along with evolutionary theory and, and other topics. He was a, a socialist and a materialist. Um, uh, in his Kingdom of Man uh, in 1911, Lancaster uh, explained um, that modern epidemics um, of various kinds affecting organisms generally uh, including human beings could be traced to the fact that in his, that in quote, his greedy efforts to produce large quantities of animals and plants, man has accumulated unnatural swarms of one species in field and ranch and unnatural crowds of his own kind in towns and fortresses. The source of the problem, he, he argued, lay in a world dominated by markets and cosmopolitan dealers in finance. And this is the leading biologist in England, a materialist, uh, a socialist, more of the social democratic variety, but a friend of Marx, um, who uh, was really the, the, the greatest uh, ecolo ecological um, thinker of his time in terms of, of uh, addressing uh, the anthropogenic causes of species extinction, for example. He was explaining uh, and, and warning, he called it uh, nature's revenge, closely resembling uh, Engels' um, reference to the revenge of nature. He called it nature's revenge um, in looking at, um, at, at causes of some diseases where, um, by parasites, bacteria, or viruses. Um, Lancaster explained that these were mainly uh, human products, the products of, of particularly of how we organized industrial agriculture in modern times and uh, uh, the livestock revolution. And so um, this, this is a, something we've known for a long time. If you, um, in, in 2000, uh, uh, Richard Levins, um, author of the dialogue dialectical biologist um, with uh, Richard Lewontin wrote an article called um, Is Capitalism a Disease for, for um, Monthly Review, um, dealing with the same issues of how um, capital in particular was generating um, uh, pandemics and, um, and um, uh, that uh, we, were, we were headed to disaster in that sense. And more recently, uh, there's a book, um, Big Farms, Big Flu by Robert, Rob Wallace, who, who um, uh, raised the issue 
uh, in, in 2016. But um, uh, what I wanted to explain is that the dominant approach to epidemiology in the world now is, um, is called uh, the One Health Model. It really rose in about 2012 as a result in response to SARS, uh, MERS, Ebola, and so on. And they became concerned and they created a more ecological approach to, to epidemiology, bringing together uh, ecologists, uh, veterinarians, uh, medical doctors, uh, public health uh, figures uh, within a broad ecological um, perspective to try to, to uh, deal with the, uh, the um, these new pandemics. And uh, this though was taken over in a couple of years by the World Bank and the, the World Trade Organization and the CDC in the United States. Uh, and um, the, uh, it became quite conventional in the sense that it addressed the ecological issues but avoided the issue of, of capital. And what arose in 2014 was what is called on the left um, was what's called uh, uh, structural One Health, uh, led by uh, Roderick Wallace, uh, Rob Wallace's father, I believe, uh, Rob Wallace, um, and a host of other scientists, uh, the um, in, um, and uh, geographers, uh, brought together the structural One Health approach, and uh, within science that. Um, uh, that focuses on the the uh, relation of these epidemia these um, these uh, pandemics uh, the the new um, uh, viruses uh, to relation to uh, to uh, the circuits of capital. Uh, so you'll find a piece in Month Review in uh, the May issue of Month Review, which which is already posted online. Uh, COVID. COVID-19 and the circuits of capital. But in the structural one approach, uh, they uh, developed um, an analysis based on, on the whole historical materials tradition, which um, emphasizes, departs from One Health by emphasizing that um, these uh, viruses can't be traced to absolute geographies, rather they have to be traced to the conduits of transmission through global capital. They see, um, they see um, these um, pandemics not as episodic, but as representing a structural crisis of capital uh, using um, Isvan Mazeros's uh, conception of the structural crisis of capital in, um, uh, in his Beyond Capital. Uh, they um, adopt a dialectical ecology of figures like Richard Levins and Lou Anton and, um, and um, they argue that um, the only answer is the reconstitution of society at large uh, based on Marx. They, they rely on Marx's analysis on the metabolic rift theory, on, um, on, on dialectical ecology, on our description of the Lauderdale paradox in, in uh, the ecological rift, on uh, Levins's uh, critique of, uh, of public health and uh, and uh, other concepts um, uh, developed um, Marxian theory, particularly the analysis of commodity chains. So what we have together, we have coming together and, and, and uh, what we have um, as a basis for understanding this crisis is a new historical materialist epidemiology that answers many of the questions and, and uh, involves a, a, um, an integration of social science and, and uh, natural science that uh, the mainstream is unable or unwilling to, to address. Uh, and so I wanted you to understand this tradition, understand that we have a more systematic critique ever, than ever before, bringing together uh, knowledge of ecological crisis uh, economic crisis and epidemiological crisis altogether. And uh, this is the key to understanding what is going on with COVID-19 and the capitalist system. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, 
Now, before I move on to our next speaker, I'd just like to announce that we are currently now on 650 views, um, which is absolutely brilliant. Keep sharing the live stream on Facebook, uh, keep tweeting the live stream, um, and hopefully um, we can have more joining us. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Amy Leather. Um, Amy Leather, would you like to uh, come in on this discussion? Thanks, Nadia, and thanks very much, John, as well. It was fascinating to hear you and so good to have you as part of this meeting today. I suppose I want to build on some of the things that you talked about um, to look at how we've ended up in this terrible situation today, where I think it's over 2 million cases of COVID-19 across the globe and something like 150,000 deaths or more. Because coronaviruses themselves are not new. Uh, they exist in animal populations. The problem, as we have found, is when they spill over from animals into the human population by a process of zoonosis, and we have no immunity to that virus. Um, and as John said, this is not an anomaly or a one-off. There have been previous coronavirus outbreaks, those of MERS and SARS. There have been other viruses like influenza, which in recent years have crossed from animals to humans. You think about bird or avian flu and swine flu. And I think in order to understand this, we have to look at the systematic way that capitalism has transformed our relationship with the wider ecosystem in ways that encourage the spread, mutation and virulence of disease. And I think that means looking at the system of industrialised agriculture and livestock production that has stretched to the absolute extreme, that rift between humans and the natural world. Because this is a model driven forward by the vast profits to be made from producing the basic grains and animals at the heart of our food system. It's a global system dominated by gigantic multinationals in cutthroat competition with each other. And really the term agribusiness is best used to describe these uh, giant multinationals. And they don't do a lot of farming themselves. Instead, they make money from the business of farming, from selling the inputs like GM and hybrid seeds, the fertilizer and pesticides to farmers. Then they store and transport and trade the grains and then they process the raw materials into food and other products. And this system is not only immensely destructive to the environment, it's now having a devastating impact on our health and lives. And you see, capitalist agriculture separates people from the land. This is an historical process that continues to play out as agribusiness expands across the globe, especially into the global south. And then it separates animals from the land, with them being reared in vast warehouses and feedlots. And these processes are entwined and create the perfect conditions for both previously isolated viruses to emerge and spill over to humans and also for viruses to spread. And I think we have to be clear, this model of industrialized agriculture began in the West, in America, where farming and agriculture underwent a great transformation in the post-war period. And then through a process of competition, that model is driven out across the globe, greatly helped often by the US state and its enforcers like the IMF and World Bank. You see, the US emerged from the Second World War, not only as a global superpower, but as an agricultural superpower. And very crucially, in that post-war period, US farmers were encouraged to grow the key grains which are at the heart of processed foods, maize, soybean and wheat. They were given subsidies and direct payments to do this. It meant US agricultural production soared, food prices came down, huge food surpluses were built up. And these subsidies and direct payments changed what it was profitable to grow. And this impacted on what it, we ate in terms of processed foods, but also how animals were reared. It's at this point it becomes very profitable to grow grain for cattle feed. And it becomes very profitable to rear chickens on soybean and maize. And really this so-called livestock revolution takes place. Before the Second World War, poultry production in America was a, a backyard operation. The average flock size was something like 70 chickens. Mass production techniques and integration meant that, they, meant that by 1992, the average flock size in the US was 30,000 strong of chickens. They've grown even bigger since. And of course, the pressure of competition means that the poultry industries in other countries follow suit, or they see the vast profits to be made and get into chicken. And so industrialized poultry production, whether it's in the US or China or the UK, is vertically integrated meaning that from birth to slaughter, animals are brought together in enormous numbers in single locations. I think I'm right to say that there's at least seven mega farms in the UK that can hold over a million chickens. And these create the ideal conditions for viruses to spread. And it's made worse by monocultures, 
We're familiar with the concept of monocropping crops in fields, but it's also true for animal rearing. Production is strictly controlled to eliminate any unplanned diversity. The animals are hybrids designed to give the best meat and standardised product. But this also prevents resistance. There's no diversity, it means there's a very limited pool of genes. It limits the variety of immune reactions to viruses as they mutate. It's essentially immune fire breaks that may slow transmission, the virus are removed. And of course, the extremely crowded and stressed conditions for animals also depress immune responses. So there are lots of opportunities for viruses to mutate and spread, particularly across poultry hosts and actually pigs, which are produced in very similar ways. And these vast factory farms are often very near human populations, creating a crossover gateway to humans. But not only did the cheap soybean and maize impact on livestock production, the subsidies also meant that US companies could produce corn and wheat and soybean below the cost of production and then go and capture the domestic market of other countries, especially in the global south. Here again, they're helped by the US government, whose representatives, places like the World Trade Organization, World Bank, IMF, forced countries to open their markets to agricultural exports from other countries. And once the markets were opened, companies like Cargill, which is one of the big four global grain traders, probably one of the biggest private companies in the world, can go in and outcompete out -compete the local farmers, essentially dump grain, take over local markets. And of course, these agricultural giants are constantly looking to expand into new countries. That was what was behind the so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s, essentially exporting the US model of industrialized agriculture with hybrid seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides to the global south. And in the process, it displaced thousands of local varieties of wheat and maize and rice. It was a mass reduction in agrobiodiversity. But also, because agriculture now required capital input, it benefited larger middle scale farmers who could afford to pay for them. The smallholders were pushed out or went bankrupt. And so the process of expanding industrial agriculture massively displaces, displaces peasant agriculture. And that's continued since the Green Revolution. In recent decades, you've seen agribusiness moving lots of its operations to the global south, where land and labour might be cheaper, resources are there, there's less regulations, and to open up new products, markets for its final products, helped by free trade agreements. I mean, the impact of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA Treaty in 94, was devastating for Mexico. It allowed US GM maize to be dumped in the country of Mexico, decimating its agriculture. And actually Mexico was the center of origin for maize. It had something like 22,000 varieties, but it had to begin importing US uh, GM maize. It also led to an expansion of industrial scale pig production in Mexico, something like 4,000 small scale producers driven out of business as the world's largest pork producer, Smithfield Foods, comes in and expands operations. And this really brings us to this other consequence of this model of industrial agriculture for the emergence of virus. As small scale farmers are displaced by large agribusiness, often to make way for these giant factory farms, it pushes those people further into what may be called the agricultural frontiers wild or untouched forest, fragile lands that were previously uncultivated, where animals that host those unknown pathogens exist. It means that the very habitat that helped isolate and contain those viruses is destroyed and brings people in closer contact with the animals that host them. And so in this way, you can see industrialized factory farming and the expansion of agribusiness pushing people off their land are not separate, they're entwined in this model. And it continues because there's a lot of scope for expansion for agribusiness. Because in fact, only 30% of the world's food is actually produced by these highly capitalized agribusiness operations. More than 70% of the world's food is still produced on small family farms on less than 25% of the world's arable land. And that's what agribusiness wants to get into, to get its hand on the land and resources, sell inputs to the farmers, its processed foods to the people. It's fueling expansion in the global south, where capital is spearheading land grabs in the last of primary forest and smallholder held farmland driving more small farmers off their land further into previously uncultivated areas. And there are countless, path countless pathogens out there that could at some point pose a threat to humans and the risk of them jumping to humans becomes more likely. You see, this is not about certain countries or regions or particular cultural habits being to blame for the outbreak of virus. It is about a system of capitalist agriculture driven by competition and profit that's the problem. And I think, you know, one of the demands from the brilliant climate movements that we saw last year, you can see it behind me, that said system change, not climate change is very apt, because actually if the reality of the problem is systemic, 
that means we actually have to challenge and replace the whole capitalist food system. Thank you very much for that, Amy. Um, before I move on to um, our next speaker, I'd just like to say um, that after Martin, we'll be, uh, we'll be reading out questions from you. Um, so I really encourage you to um, carry on putting your questions and uh, contributions in the comment box below. Um, and we'll be, hearing for, uh, we'll be uh, reading them out um, after Martin speaks. Um, yeah, without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Martin. Martin, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, look, thank you very much, uh, uh, John and John and Amy. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit about how Marx's, uh, Marx and Engels' uh, theories are at heart inherently ecological. And because they are inherently ecologically, they are a, a revolutionary theory for, for, for our times. Um, and I think the way that, that uh, Marxism was originally developed by Marx and Engels and then built upon by a succession of thinkers, including, to be honest, John, John Bellamy Foster, I think gives us important insights into the way that different human societies and indeed capitalist society relate to, uh, to, 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 to nature. And I think it's important to sort of go right back to the basics of that. I mean, um, historical materialism begins from the concrete reality um, that humans have and must have an ongoing relationship with 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 nature if they're to if they're to survive. There's a, a famous um, uh, speech given by Frederick Engels at the uh, Karl Marx's funeral, and, and and one of the points he makes in it is a really obvious one, but it's absolutely crucial, I think, for us. So he says that uh, uh, people must first of all eat, drink, and have shelter and clothing before they can pursue politics, science, art, and art and religion. And I think it's that grounding of the theory of the understanding of human society in the reality of the world that we live in that makes Marxism such a powerful tool for understanding what's happening to the environment, to, uh, uh, climate change, global warming, the biodiversity crisis and so on, as well as, as what we're seeing with, with COVID-19. Um, and every human society, whether it's hunter-gatherers 10, tens of thousands of years ago, or feudal societies with slaves and lords, or, or the capitalist society that we, we live in today, all of those societies have that ongoing relationship with, uh, with, with nature, a dialectical relationship, uh, a relationship of constant change, but it's there fundamentally uh, in terms of how they organize their, uh, 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 their, their societies. And... Um, the particular economic organization of those societies mediates and changes that relationship with nature and it changes it detrimentally and it alters it constantly uh, over 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 time and that's why in one sense marxism is inherently ecological because it starts from that relationship with humans and, uh, and nature but there's there's another aspect too as well which i think john john talked about earlier which is the fact that that nature plays a role in production. It's an essential part of the productive process for, uh, for, for, for capitalism. Um, Marx thought, thought this was so important. He, uh, when he wrote a critique of the German Social Democrats in, 19, in the 1875, the critique of the Gotha program, he starts uh, uh, by emphasizing, re-emphasizing uh, uh, that human labor isn't just the source of all wealth, that, that nature forms uh, a source as well, but it has to, uh, it, it can be only released or, 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 or only manifests with uh, with the force of nature, with human labour power itself. And, and I think one of the things that happens with the development of capitalism is a complete transformation in uh, humans' relationship with nature. It's a, it's a transformation uh, that goes beyond any other relationship that humans have ever had with the natural world uh, around them. Capitalism is a, a system of generalised commodity production, um, and as such, nature itself becomes a commodity under, under capitalism. And any attempt to understand nature, any attempt to understand uh, by scientists to understand it, really at root becomes an attempt uh, uh, to to understand nature from the point of view of capital, for making more uh, profits to help them accumulate more uh, 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 more wealth. There's a, uh, I mean, Marx writes about this wonderfully um, in, in in a quote I often use from the Grundrisse because it it's a quote that could be written by left ecologists uh, today. Um, and he writes that for the first time under capitalism, nature becomes purely an object for humankind, purely a matter of utility. It ceases to be recognized as a power for itself. The theoretical discovery of its autonomous laws are merely a ruse to subjugate it under human need, whether as an object of consumption 
or as a means of production. And that helps us understand how they treat nature, how the capitalists use nature, why they don't see a wood for what it is as a system of ecology. Instead, they see it as a source of lumber for the, for the wood industry, a source of profits for, 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 the, for the capital. And, and for that system to spread around the world, the uh, 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 capitalists had to completely smash all pre-existing relationships and societies uh, relating to nature differently. I mean, they began that in England with the, uh, the enclosure of land, the driving off of the peasantry, the destruction of the peasantry in, in Europe, but then they spread it around the world. When they, when they go to the Americas or they go to Australia and they meet indigenous people who have completely different relationships with nature, they, they destroy those, uh, those communities, they break them up, they kill uh, uh, millions of people and they impose their own view of nature and society upon the rest of the world, their own uh, 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 view. And that, that process, as Amy said, I think continues, uh, continues today with the way that industrial agriculture uh, uh, is imposed upon sub-Saharan Africa or South America and indigenous and pe uh, peasant ways of relating to, to nature and growing food and so on are, um, are, are, are cast by the, uh, the wayside. Capitalism begins uh, as Marx famously said, with the destruction of the soil and and the uh, and uh, and the worker, and the, the the ideology that the capitalists develop around nature uh, is one where they see an attempt by uh, they that they see that they have to dominate nature, they have to control it, manage it, they have to bash it into 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 submission, and and I think against this we have to offer a different understanding of our place in the natural world. We have to under start from that dialectical relationship between us and human society and the, nat and na the natural world that we, are, that we are part of. And we have to pose a revolutionary theory because if you see that capitalism rests upon the systematic degradation of the natural world in the interest of the accumulation of capital in the interest of making profit, then the only logical conclusion is, is that we have to have a revolutionary overturning of the, of the existing social, social relations. Um, and I think it's, it's brilliant, for instance, that many of the new social movements, Extinction Rebellion, the climate strikes and so on, have, have posed new ways of doing that through things like the, the Green New Deal. Um, but I think, as, as Naomi Klein says, that those, those, uh, those attempts to offer a, a new sustainable society uh, can only succeed in as much as they are challenges to, uh, to capitalism, in as much as they are challenges to the existing uh, systems, in as much as they take on and start to bypass and, uh, and break the multinational fossil fuel companies, the big industrial agricultural corporations, and uh, and uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, there's and, and and more than that. I mean, there's a lovely part in Naomi Klein's new book uh, on, on the Green New Deal called "On On Fire," where where she talks about the uh, how how environmentalism cannot be separated off from all the other struggles in society. How the environmental movement has to take up questions of social justice, of questions of indigenous rights, of anti-racism how the, uh, uh, the social justice movements cannot ignore environmentalism, and indeed how the trade union movement and the working class need to take up all those issues as part of struggling for that sustainable, a sustainable world. Because ultimately, the system that is destroying the planet um, is doing so on the back of attacking workers' rights, uh, driving austerity, imposing racism, uh, funding and supporting the fossil fuel corporations, encouraging industrial agriculture, which leads to more pandemics, as, as John and Amy have uh, have uh, have said and that's why i think ultimately the ideas outlined by john and amy and uh, 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 going all the way back to marx and engels are ones that seek to both understand the world understand how capitalism uses and relates to the natural world but then actually use them as a guide to action uh, uh, a vision of a strategy that can uh, transform the uh, 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 the world take on the capitalists and uh, and build a, a sustainable society that's run in the interests of people people and planet Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, and I look forward to hearing back from all of our speakers um, very, very soon. But now um, it's time for the part of the event where we hear the questions from you. And we do have um, a couple just to get the, them up. So just to read out um, four of the questions that have come through and then we'll bring our speakers in and um, have a second round after that. Um, first, uh, Dora asks, why have such pandemics become more frequent and more dangerous during the 20th century? And why is this trend continuing <laughs> continuing uh, into the first part of the 21st century, despite the efforts of modern medicine to contain them? We've got another question here from Fu Wong, uh, which is, 
how did previous economic systems overcome the metabolic rift, rifts of their time? And how does capitalism over, overcome ecological crisis, past, present and future? Um, the, we've got a question as well from Martha, which is, uh, would veganism prevent such viruses? Um, and finally, oh, sorry. Yeah, that is, sorry, that's all of our, yeah. Uh, we'll go with those ones for now. Um, yeah, we'll go with those first questions for now. Uh, sorry, everyone, for the scattiness. Um, but before I uh, bring in our speakers, I'd just like to say that right now we're on 700 views, um, which is absolutely brilliant. Keep sharing, keep uh, tweeting, um, and so on. But um, yeah, going back to the questions, um, John, would you like to come in? I mean, what do you think uh, in response to those? Well, the, the big change, uh, in the late 20th century and in the early 21st century, in the few decades of, of this century, has been uh, a globalization of production, and particularly um, uh, agribusiness is, is uh, important in this. We have um, the globalization of production is driven, uh, first of all, by uh, what we call the the global labor arbitrage. That is the, uh, the system's exploitation of low unit uh, labor costs in, um, in poor countries in the global south. Uh, wages are much lower um, than in the north. Um, pennies uh, an hour are paid to uh, workers and um, productivity um, um, is, is quite high in the global south because uh, the technology of multinational corporations and processes are, are basically exported there for production. So production has been relocated to um, uh, the global south and um, we have these long uh, commodity chains. Uh, so um, some corporations now have, have uh, such long commodity chains ex extending over the world that they have, um, they have uh, if you go through the, the first tier, second tier, and third tier uh, suppliers, they have something like one point, uh, over a million um, different firms in their supply chains uh, we've discovered. And, uh, the, um, in their total supply chains. Meanwhile, we've got a global land arbitrage where cheap land is, um, is also being um, capitalized upon. Peasants are being moved off of uh, subsistence agriculture. And uh, in, the, in the greatest mass migration in history, a vast de-peasantization, creation of urban slums, and in this process, there is uh, the um, replacement of subsistence agriculture with uh, agribusiness with its um, monocultures. You have large, um, um, uh, lives, you have the livestock revolution, large feedlots, giant feedlots, giant poultry farms mixed with, um, with um, what remains of wild nature, deforestation. And it's creating a melange for for disease with these um, the monocultures and the uh, agribusiness conditions create um, a greater susceptibility to uh, viruses that um, and for zoonoses. So this is like um, a giant global petri dish that's developing that um, uh, is is uh, the root of these pandemics. And to understand it, you have to look at the circuits of capital. People have been mapping the commodity chains and how these viruses are, are um, moving up the commodity chains essentially. And um, uh, that, that's the essential aspect. Uh, offshore farming consisting of genetic monocultures of domestic animals, eliminating immune fire breaks, including massive hog, hog feed lots and vast poultry farms coupled with rapid deforestation and the chaotic mixing of wild birds and other wildlife with industrial animal production, not excluding wet markets, have created the conditions for the spread of new deadly pathogens 
such as SARS, MERS, Ebola, H1N1, H5N1, and now SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19. Um, Amy, I'd like to bring you in. I mean, what are your thoughts uh, on the questions uh, uh, submitted to us? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, John. That was a very comprehensive answer. I mean, I think I'll, I'll take that up because about the question of veganism, because of course, uh, we pointed to how livestock is reared and the problems with that in giant factory farms and the, um, how a virus can mutate and spread within that. But I think we've also got to be honest that you can't abstract one aspect of food production from the rest of capitalist agriculture. And just because something is perhaps organic or vegan doesn't necessarily mean it's been produced sustainably. And we've looked into how agribusiness um, expanding into the global south, pushing out um, small uh, farmers or, or peasants, meaning they're pushed further into sort of previously uncultivated land and, and forests where pathogens um, may exist. But actually, that is also sometimes for plant-based foods as well. Um, if you think about soybean, yes, it's uh, being produced to feed to animals, but something like, I mean, soybeans, by the way, uh, once you, you know, crush a soybean, it can be used for many, many different things. Something like 60% of processed foods in the UK um, have soybeans in them in some way. And actually, some of those will be what they call plant-based. Um, I looked at the Subway vegan pate, it's got lots of soy in it. Um, actually, the Brazil, in Brazil, the Amazon was opened up in the 1980s, actually for massive soybean production. Cargill actually drove it. So you see these agribusiness going in for plant-based foods in Mexico, clearing the rainforest at the moment to grow avocados, to take advantage of the recent boom that's gone on. Or you think of quinoa, it's an ancient Andean staple. It was cultivated on terraced hillsides. It was quite a complex cropping and animal husbandry rotation system. It actually sustained llama for many years. Actually now it's popular in the West, it's gone up in price. It's cultivated as a monocrop in large mechanized fields. The people that traditionally ate it can't afford to. They have to rely on cheap imported breads and pastas. So my point here is just because something is plant-based doesn't mean to say it's being produced sustainably, as I say. And actually it's part of that bigger complex of agribusiness moving in to make money out of our food systems and in the process driving practices that can actually fuel further um, viruses um, spreading or spilling over from you know previously isolated areas to humans um, in that way. So I think we have to look at it as a whole and that leads us to how we have to bring about change which then isn't just about obviously we want to make the best food choices we can as individuals but actually that isn't enough we actually have to look at the whole system and challenge those multinationals that make money out of it at every level and are fueling that and you know take advantage from it I'll stop there Great. Well, uh, all right. Thanks for that, um, Amy. Uh, Martin, I'd like to bring you in now. Um, what is what? Uh, what would you respond to those questions that were given? I, I want to talk about the the question about the metabolic rift, and the, 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 which really looks at how historic human societies, pre-capitalist societies, should we say for shorthand, uh, relate to, uh, to to perhaps environmental crisis. Because I think the key point about Marx is theory of metabolism and the metabolic rift is that it's about how capitalism disturbs, creates a metabolic rift, disturbs the metabolic interaction that humans have had uh, with the natural world through history. And, and I think that's important to understand the, uh, the, the complete quantitative and qualitative change that capitalism means in terms of how uh, uh, environmental crisis becomes endemic. Because if you think about prehistoric society, if you since imagine, for instance, hunter-gatherer communities, or if you uh, think about um, uh, 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 peasant uh, feudal production and uh, with peasantries and and the lord and so on, what you're effectively talking about is societies that relate to the natural world in more or less a sustainable way. And that's not to say they don't have 
environmental problems or sometimes cause environmental destruction. But under capitalism, that interaction, that ongoing interaction that happens between nature, uh, nature and society is systematically, uh, is systematically destroyed. That's why, for instance, when John talks about what Marx does when he's writing Capital and, and other, other works, and he looks systematically at the works of Justice von Liebig and so on, is what he's doing is he's making a scientific analysis of how uh, those societies, in this case through ind industrial agriculture, systematically undermine the, the, the fertility of the soil uh, in, in the hinterlands of, say, London. The, 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 the nature of production in those societies, because it's now driven by profit and not to fulfil the needs of people in however distorted a way class, class society does, because under capitalism it's driven by profit, it systematically uh, destroys the, uh, the, the environment. And the only way that the capitalist system can find to uh, to fix it is to bring in external nutrients in the for farm, a, a form of guano, um, a bird poo, or uh, or later on manufactured fertilizers and pesticides and uh, and so on. The only way they can fix that metabolic rift is by finding alternative external sources of uh, uh, to to solve it, and and that that's that's completely different to how prehistoric uh, pre 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 capitalist societies may have related. And I also think it's. It, it leads in then to the question about um, uh, veganism, which I think Amy's answered brilliantly, because what capitalism tries to get us to do is to respond to these questions on the level of individualism. What are you doing to fix the problem on your own? Are you cycling instead of driving a car? Are you, uh, are you not flying? Or are you eating vegan or vegetarian foods instead of, of meat? But actually, the problem is a systemic one. The problem is with the whole of, uh, of society. And that cannot be challenged or changed on the, uh, on the basis of, uh, of one or two individual, individual choices, ho however positive they may be on, 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 for a personal for a personal level, what has to be done is a, a, a is, is a transformation of society, so we can heal that metabolic rift. That we can have a, a new form of society with a completely uh, a, a, a much more sustainable relationship with nature. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, Martin. Um, very brief and concise. Um, I'm going to uh, read out the second uh, set of questions um, and then I'm going to be bringing back um, our speakers, um, not just to respond to them, but to make any final uh, points, any, uh, uh, leave us with any uh, uh, final thoughts and so on um, in this meeting. Uh, but the next four questions uh, actually tie in together that I'm going to read out. So first we've got from Nathan, um, how do, how to, how do you keep, how do you, sorry, there's a bit of a typo. Uh, how do you keep the movement going against ecological collapse going into lockdown? Um, the second one is from Hamish who asks, given the incredibly urgent need for profound change, how can we rapidly engage and mobilize a collaboration uniting many groups who are already working to resist this system? And Bibi asks, can we undo the damage done to the soil and prevent further corruption of the planet? Um, and our final question from Fran is, uh, what might food production look like under socialism? Um, those are our four questions. Um, I'd just like to see from our speakers, have you gotten all of those? Uh, yeah. um, brilliant. So <clears throat> I'll leave uh, the speakers with uh, those four questions. Um, first, uh, I'd like to bring in, uh, bring back um, John Bellamy Foster. Uh, so John, um, what do you say uh, uh, to those final um, points that have been sent in? Well, all of these uh, questions have to do, I guess, um, in various forms with uh, what is to be done and um, how do we organize on this situation? In the situation, uh, what kind of um, society do we create? I think it. Um, I think it um, requires a lot of rethinking of uh, our own analysis and strategies. And um, although um, although historical materialism has been the broadest of of all critiques, um, we have to. Um, we have to um, broaden our analysis even more. And um, we're seeing that with the uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic, um, pandemic, the issues are, are uh, coming up that um, 
that we haven't really talked about that much. There's there are enormous resources in our tradition. There is a, a critical vein of thought. Um, there's development of Marxist Marxist ecology. There's a building on on Marx and Engels's own ecological and even ep epidemiological critiques and um, that of other socialists and um, on, on dialectical ecology. We need to go back to uh, Engels's dialectics of nature and look at it again. Um, the, uh, I argue in the return of nature, uh, uh, Engels had said that uh, dialect, that nature is the key to dialectics or nature is the proof of dialectics. What he really meant in our contemporary terms is that ecology is the proof of dialectics. And we've got to learn what that means and build it into our critique. All too often we've looked at things in an economically deterministic way or, um, or at least uh, seeing um, everything as, um, as uh, economic. We have to understand um, how that is actually related to uh, ecological contradictions to uh, the etiology of disease and so on. So we, we have to synthesize and the same thing we have to do in our political movements. We have to um, uh, create what I think David Harvey um, uh, quite usefully came up with uh, the, um, the notion of co-revolution and you know, uh, building on, on what in ecological terms we call co-evolution and um, emphasizing the interdependencies, but by co-revolution, he meant uh, bringing all of our, our revolutionary movements, all of our anti-capitalist movements together in, in a new uh, practical synthesis, a, a revolution of theory and practice that um, we can call, um, um, we can call a co-revolution because it recognizes that social reproduction, um, which um, gender theorists have developed that um, theories of racial capitalism, the ecological critique, the classical critique of, of economics and so on are all interrelated and that our movements have to reflect that growing in, uh, understanding. The, the crisis, structural crisis of capitalism is now taking such a wide orbit and taking on so many aspects that we, um, we have new possibilities, um, but we have to understand what those possibilities are. And we have to have um, a broader conception of what the future is. The question is, you know, um, well, how do you organize a, re uh, a revolution? Well, I think it has to be a co-revolutionary movement. Uh, how do we do it in terms of lockdown? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but um, we have to, um, it will force us um, at least to develop new uh, strategies, new new forms of revolutionary praxis, which we can then employ as well when we're out out of lockdown. In terms of um, in terms of uh, preserving the soil, you know, it's not just the soil. Of course, it's the entire planetary environment. Um, the structural one health that I was talking about, the historical materialist epidemiology. Uh, argues that we have to create a new sustainable planetary metabolism, uh, not, not simply uh, new in that we, we borrow from the past. Um, from, uh, we can learn from peasant agriculture. We need small farms and subsistence um, um, production. We need um, a lot of the things from, from uh, the, the residuals from from civilization, all sorts of anti-capitalist elements that are in the past and are also in the future that um, that realize that um, blend together in the context of an, a new period, a new transition. So we we have to um, we have to uh, do all of that. Marx um, basically, when he defined socialism at its deepest level, he he said it was about. Um, the, the uh, associated, this is in volume three of Capital, he says the social, uh, associated producers have to rationally regulate uh, their metabolism with nature um, in such a way as to uh, promote uh, human, qualitative human development and preserve energy. Um, that's, that's a paraphrase, but it's very close to the original. It shows that, that Marx didn't define 
um, socialism just as the negation of capitalism. He defined uh, socialism as a whole new way of relating to nature and relating to ourselves. Thank you. A final and very, very big thank you to you, John, for joining us um, for this uh, Facebook meeting. I think we've, uh, I've certainly found what you said to be incredibly um, insightful. Um, I'm going to switch things up a bit and um, hand over instead now to um, Martin um, to leave us with some final points um, before we draw things to a close. Um, I think they're great questions and they really go to the heart of why we're having this meeting, never mind the, the, the theory of Marx and, uh, and Engels. So just the two brief questions about agriculture and farming. Um, I, I think the first thing is, is can we undo the damage to the soil? Well, uh, yes, but it depends how you try and do that. If you want to try and fix the uh, problems of soil fertility uh, through the same methods of farming that industrial agriculture is attempting to impose upon the, uh, the, the rest of the world, then, then no, all you can do is to make the situation worse. And, you know, th th there isn't, ultimately, you can pour chemicals into the soil, uh, but that doesn't fix the problem long, 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 long term. Uh, on the other hand, if you, as John said, if you actually recognize that there are all sorts of different ways of farming around the world that are incredibly all, uh, sustainable, much, much more sustainable than where we live in, we can learn from those. There's a, there's a wonderful film that came out last year called The Biggest Little Farmer about a farm in, in California where the owners took over an area of land that had been completely destroyed by uh, monocultural uh, uh, growing of um, almonds, I, I, I think. And over a period of a few years, they rebuilt up the ecosystems to grow all sorts of different uh, crops together, integrating animal husbandry with uh, with 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 uh, uh, small farm production and so on to to revitalize the soil. But it was a process that took a long time and a huge amount of uh, of, uh, of money. It's not an easy process, but they built on the knowledge that small farmers have had for. For, 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 for years. Which brings me on to the second question about what farming would look like under, uh, under socialism. I mean, firstly, who particularly knows? There isn't, of course, a blueprint for any of this. I think one thing we can say is it, uh, it won't look like the uh, appalling monocrop uh, farming that we've seen over the world. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it will simply be about small farming. I, I, I find it difficult to imagine that that will re-emerge in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, it certainly won't be a return to sort of some sort of peasant uh, agriculture, because I think that brings with it all sorts of other, other issues. I tend to think that uh, agriculture will develop in new and interesting ways, perhaps learning from small farming and mixed farming and so on, uh, and, uh, and, and bringing it into line with sort of more uh, modern, modern methods of farming, but with a view not to making profits, but to feed people sustainably. And um, the final thing really is about the questions of social movements. Um, I, I, I'm sure Amy will We'll talk more about this, but you know, at the beginning of the year, we were looking at what was going to be an enormous year of political activity. With the, um, I mean, we forget now through COVID that the year started with appalling fires across Australia, um, uh, and, and I think that was going to fuel huge nights of protest building towards the climate talks in November in Glasgow. Now that's not that, that's not going to happen. But what is happening is the beginnings of sort of social movements around the question of relating to COVID-19. And I think we want to try and integrate some of the environmental movements, Extinction Rebellion and climate strikes into that, uh, that those movements that are fighting for communities and jobs not to not to be made sick or, or, or killed by the by the disease and going going forward the, the reality is is climate change is going to be there uh, whatever happens however long this lockdown is climate change will be there and that will force people to into struggle force people to uh, to stand up and what form that movement takes well I hope it builds on what went before but I think what socialists have to be constantly trying to do is to both make those those movements and those struggles bigger but also to work uh, to bring uh, uh, bring a revolutionary tactic in. And I think if, if, if Marx's theory tells us nothing, uh, it, it tells us that the answer has to be revolutionary. The answer cannot be the reform of capitalism. The answer cannot be uh, uh, simply about trying to make capitalism more sustainable. It has to be about smashing capitalism and replacing it with a sustainable socialist uh, socialist world. And I think that's really what uh, this, this, this talk has been about today. And certainly what Marx and Engels understood about their, their, their ecological work. And I think it's certainly what John has brought out in his writings about uh, uh, Marxism and uh, ecology over the, uh, over the years. Thank you very much. 
Thank you again, uh, Martin, for that. Um, I'd like to bring in our last speaker uh, to respond to the questions and really make uh, close the discussion for us. Um, Amy, would you like to come in? Okay, thanks, Nadia. And thanks to the other speakers. Um, great to hear the questions and the responses. Just on the question about what sort of other agriculture and how it would look, um, I think, you see, it is right to say we'd learn from actually a lot of examples that exist today. You see, one of the things that I think is really bad is how big agribusiness justifies wanting to expand into the global south by saying, oh, you know, we've got to help all these poor peasants. You know, we've got to help feed the world. They're very backward, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, it's a very colonial and racist view, I think, of the world, because actually peasants have an immense knowledge of their own soils and of their climate. They're massive experimenters with seeds, you know, actual seeds when you save them and can combine different ones to, to produce new offspring. You know, they've produced drought, you know, uh, drought resistant varieties of seeds. Um, they've built soils. Um, and these are the things that, you know, essentially um, this knowledge is taken over and, and dismissed by these multinationals imposing their own model. But I also think it's right not to romanticise peasant agriculture. Amazing knowledge, but often backbreaking work, uh, you know, often just using hoes. And I think a different vision is actually how you combine that knowledge that exists amongst people there at the front of it, but with the advances in technology that can make life easier and better. Not a technology that's imposed because you want to make profit from people, but actually one that is uh, beneficial to us all. And that means ownership and control is needed. It means actually wresting food production and agriculture out of the hands of multinationals. And to be honest, there's been a lot of battles over this in the global south. Big battles in, in Mexico to stop GMAs being introduced. Big battles to stop land grabs in places like Mozambique. Big battles to stop, uh, to allow farmers to save their seeds. Uh, in places like Malawi and others. So these are big battles going on there and they're part of that global movement that people are referring to that was particularly inspiring last year when the climate movement burst onto the streets. And that really brings us to what do we do now that people are asking about because it is quite a strange situation. Here we are faced with this colossal social, political and economic crisis. Most of us, our instinct would be to get on the streets and have mass collective action except that isn't really what we can do in the same way. And as Martin said, we were planning those mass demonstrations for when all the you know, heads of different governments from around the world were gonna to come to Glasgow for the COP21 climate talks um, in, in November, that's, that's been canceled now. But I think there are other ways that we're beginning to get organized and things we have to think about, you see. Because a lot of people are saying during this COVID-19 crisis, we can't go back to how things were. And that's right, but we can't just, Think it's going to end and we won't go back. What we do now during this current crisis will shape the outcome and what comes next because I think we've got to be clear all of these issues when we talk about them they are class issues and coronavirus and the outbreak of virus is a class issue. You know people say it doesn't discriminate except it does. You're more likely to die if you're black. The impact if you're poor is very different than if you are rich in this way. And there are big battles going on at the moment over the rights for protective equipment, for testing, for our NHS workers, the social care workers, for frontline workers to be given the equipment they need to keep them safe, to fight for pay for people when they're laid off, for people to literally not be able to access food in Britain as well as other places because they haven't got enough money and are literally missing meals and beginning to starve. These are big battles and it's interesting when you talk about the essential workers because I was just literally reading an article before this meeting it turns out that big factory farm places are not only places where virus itself can spread amongst animals and mutate they're also places where virus is now spreading between the workers there in America Smithfield I mentioned it before it's probably it's the biggest pork producer in the world it has massive operations in America it's had to close its plant in South Dakota because there are it has three and a half thousand workers there they produce five percent of the us's pork in that one factory except 200 of those workers or more now have covid19 at least one have died and actually smithfield didn't take the precautions to actually try and uh, protect its workers it actually offered them incentives to get them to work longer to the end of their shifts this shows how actually it gets to the heart of our system and shows which workers have been effective and, and how we have to have those big battles about how we protect ourselves in that way. And I think it brings us to the point about how we actually, what Mark, um, Martin just talked about, about having to get rid of the whole system. You see, because on the one hand, capitalism 
has these tremendous, tremendous advances in the world and te new technologies and what we can do, except that it throws us backwards and can't deal with it. Think of it now. We are essentially dealing with COVID-19 in the same way that the Derbyshire villages of Eam had did when they self-isolated in 1665 to stop the outbreak of plague. It's a primitive method of dealing with it because capitalism can't solve it. And that's the truth. Capitalism cannot solve this crisis. It helped create it. And actually, it's not going to make the change. It didn't heed the warnings of previous outbreaks um, of coronaviruses and influences. And it's not going to make the changes needed to prevent this in the future. Don't tell me that now those multinationals are saying, oh, we'll stop land grabbing in the global south. Actually, we'll put on hold that deal to expand our uh, poultry production. It's not doing that. And I think that we are saying very clearly that if you agree with the things that we have talked about today, then actually we need to be organised to take that fight to those vested interests at the top. And that means we would like you to join us in the Socialist Workers' Party. We are part of wanting to shape a response to COVID-19 so that we don't pay for it with our lives, but we are also fighting for a different world completely where people come before profit. We would like you to join us in the SWP in that fight. All right. Thank you for that, um, Amy. And thank you really to all of our speakers for what, uh, you know, for, for leading off what's been a brilliant discussion. Um, and all of you at home as well who've contributed to that discussion. I think it's been um, a really brilliant uh, uh, meeting today. Um, and it's worth saying that we've had over 700 uh, Sorry, we've had uh, over 730 views um, throughout the course of this meeting. So it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and thank you to all of those who've been sharing and tweeting uh, the live stream as, as it's gone along. Um, just to, like Amy said, uh, if you liked this event um, and if you agree with what's been said today and you want to be part of uh, the fight against the rotten system that we've described that produces the sort of crises, then please do join the Socialist Worker Party. Um, you can uh, join on the link that will be left in the description box uh, in the event for in the event page uh, for event page for this meeting um, or you can visit our website as well um, which will also be uh, 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 posted um, in that description box um, and also uh, a final thing I wanted to say is all of our speakers tonight have authored books that are available um, at Bookmarks, the Socialist Bookshop. Um, Bookmarks has been posting on the Facebook event uh, page for this meeting uh, throughout the meeting. Um, and so you can find their, their uh, social media through that. Um, but I'd also say visit Bookmarks' website, have a look at what they've got, buy books, um, donate even, and support you know, a radical independent socialist bookshop. Um, uh, and the final thing really um, that I'd like to end on is that we'll be back next Saturday with another Facebook Live event, um, with another Facebook Live event. But in the meantime, do follow the SWP on Twitter, on Facebook um, and Instagram. You know, your support um, absolutely uh, uh, matters and, and, you know, change is uh, absolutely possible, as we've seen um, in the discussion. Uh, thanks again to everyone for joining us um, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Solidarity.